Welcome back to the Chatters Box Podcast. My name is Kyle McClellan, your host, and uh, we are rolling this year. We're halfway through our episodes, and uh, for this episode, we have current Cardinals reliever Ryan Helsley. Ryan, thank you for stepping in the Chatters Box, and I hope you appreciate that we have your bobblehead that I think was just out a couple weeks ago, so we want to make sure you felt welcome when you come in here. Yeah, I think you guys should have me. Excited to be here. So uh, I texted Adam Wainwright, former teammate of mine, still really good friend of mine. I said, hey, I don't know Ryan Helsley. Um, what do I need to know? I'm, I'm interviewing him tomorrow. And, uh, and he texted me back and he said, great dude. Uh, you're you're going to love him outdoorsman as am I. So I love that. Um, but ask him why he never pitches on days that I pitch. <laughs> and I said, okay, I'll, I'll start off with that. So why don't you ever pitch? I think I have a reason for it, but I want to know your reason. Why don't it's, you ever pitch? Because he's Adam always pitches? going nine innings. You know, I mean, that's why. <laughs> I, mean, uh, I don't know. It's just funny because, I mean, it feels like it always works out that way. At least it did last year. And then. The one time I did pitch, I think I gave up like a two-run homer, and then he didn't get the win, you know, and then he gives me crap about that too. But it's just all, you know, fun and games. I'm sure he would like to have you uh, on those days. But, you know, I was I played with Adam when he did go nine. I mean, it was like a we sat down in the bullpen and we just kicked our feet up. We had Chris Carpenter and Adam Wainwright back-to-back. You're talking, you know, 2008, 2009, 2010, and it was like for us maybe the closer would get up. Yeah. But outside of that, those those two took it and run with it but uh, I want to know what um what has Adam meant to you because I, I he was a teammate of mine I've, I've said it many many times one of the biggest influences in my life not only in my career but in my life but uh what's it been like for you to be around him over the last few years and this being his last year you know what's kind of your thoughts and emotions on that yeah he's been awesome you know watching him coming up through the minor leagues you know who Adam Wainwright is being a St. Louis Cardinal and then getting to be his teammates been just so surreal he's you know, you hear about how good of a guy he is and then being able to share the locker room and share the field with him, you know, it's just so much more than, you know, you can ever imagine how great of a person he is. And, you know, he's a fierce competitor and, you know, he sheds his love and, you know, that competitiveness on the rest of the clubhouse. And, you know, you really feel that and he's a great teammate to have. And, you know, he, he's been fun. He's I've been getting, getting closer to him, you know, over the last four or five years now. He's more like a brother and like a father figure, you know, in that clubhouse as he has been for many guys, like you said. And, you know, it's, it's sad having him the, thinking this is last year, you know, having Yachty gone last year and Pujols and, you know, just Cardinal staples for what seems like the whole entire franchise has ever existed. You know, you think of those guys and to think that he won't be here next year will be sad. But, you know, I know he's got a lot of fun and exciting things ahead of him and with his family afterwards. What What's your biggest takeaway been from him? Just watching him and, and learning because, you know, he pitched in the bullpen as well. So obviously there's some help there that, that he can offer for you. Yeah, that was that was big for me. You know, I always asked him, you know, when he came in, you know, like you said earlier, a lot of guys come in through the bullpen and you get in the big leagues and then start. And he was the same way. And, you know, he said he thinks it really helped him be a starter because when you come in the bullpen, you know, every pitch really matters. You don't have time to kind of get in a groove or fill things out, you know, from pitch one, it's go time. And he thinks that's what kind of helped him be a better starter and helped, you know, prolong his careers, having that competitiveness and really understanding how important each pitch really is. For, for me, when I, I started in 2011, uh, when he had Tommy John and, uh, and, and I would call him on every, you know, the morning of every start from the hotel room, we go over scouting report and everything. Uh, that's, that's the kind of teammate he is, the kind of guy he is. He's not there with the team, but he's helping him pouring in. Uh, one thing that I really think that helped me and, and me and him talked about this a lot was after you've pitched in the bullpen and you figure out how to get yourself out of jams and you don't panic when it's second and third and one out or you know you know how to get that ground ball then when you go to the rotation if you ever have that opportunity all of a sudden you know it's second and third nobody out and everybody's freaking out and you're like man I'm used to this you know I know how to kind of calm it down take it pitch by pitch so like you said I mean that's a that's something you can take there into any situation but you definitely learn it in the the bullpen yeah you know I mean as a starter looking back on my minor league career there's always that one inning you know if you can kind of minimize it or control that inning you're probably going to have a pretty good start most of the time you know and obviously there's those games where it seems like every inning guys are on or somebody's scoring you know but um, if you're able to minimize you know that damage you know you're going to probably be able to have a good start or a good outing and you know I think like you said being in the bullpen you know especially on the back end of the game, you're always, the pressure's kind of always on and, you know, guys are looking and leaning on you and being able to kind of slow the game down, I think really helps and, you know, not let it speed up on you. So I want to go back. Uh, you grew up in Oklahoma. We're going to start back in the beginning. Grew up in Oklahoma. Grew up a Cardinals fan, am I right? Yeah. So watching all the games, did you guys come to games uh, often or every once in a while? So or? I came to a few games growing up. We actually played in a little World Series here when I was probably around 10 years old, 8 years old, whatever, and uh, we went to the old, stadium I think before this one was built um 
and I, I watched games, but I wasn't like a crazy fan. I mean, I had two brothers, and we lived out on some land with, you know, my great grandparents had a few hundred acres, so I was always outside running around and, you know, just being a kid, I wasn't really watching too much TV growing up. But I remember watching Yachty, Albert, and Wayno, you know, so getting to be in the clubhouse with them <laughs> last year was pretty surreal being a little kid and seeing them on TV and then getting to share the field with them. Yeah, so you get drafted uh, by the Cardinals, fifth round, if I, if I remember right, yep. doing my research. Um, you know, what's that like? You come out of a Division Two school, so uh, fifth round, Division Two, coming into the minor leagues, just kind of walk through that. Yeah, I mean, so my freshman year of college, I played summer ball in California with a lot of, like, D1 guys, and I didn't want to go up first. You know, I wanted to be a kid and have a summer, but I'm, I'm thankful I went because I think that kind of got me ready for pro ball and getting that taste of what it's like facing guys you know who are better than me and kind of give myself some confidence the summer before of you know I can get outs at a higher level and you know when I first got drafted coming from such a small school I just tried to take the mindset it was like I was, was going to have those guys beat me you know if I wasn't good enough then I wasn't going to be good enough so I just tried to attack guys from the get-go and I think I kind of carried that throughout the minor leagues and you know kept it with me in the big leagues. And you were a starter in the, in the minor leagues and and put up you know really good numbers uh went relatively fast through the minor leagues and you get to the big leagues and then you know it's all uh, we talked about it right before we went on here but it I feel like it's every conversation with every young starter in the minor leagues right I mean it's hard to be I don't think people realize how hard it is to come up and be a starting pitcher in the major leagues I mean you're, you're fully exposed right I mean all anything you're not able to do um is 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 out there it's on video and these are the best in the world that are trying to do it so it's hard to to be successful at that point so most guys either go back and forth you know they they come up for a few starts and they go back down they got to work on some or they go down in the bullpen and then all of a sudden carve out a niche and say actually you're you're pretty dang good down (laughs) here and we can change a few things here change the mentality change your approach and and you could be a weapon down here and that's that's ultimately where you've landed at landed as of right now yeah um it's been it's been fun you know i've never gotten a, a chance to actually start in the big leagues you know I don't know if, if that will ever happen you know you said last year I had a a great year you know and maybe that's where I'll stick and you know just try to take it one day at a time you know how long seasons are and you know you can't really look too far ahead because you know when you start doing that things start to speed up and you just gotta pump the brakes sometimes you know and just take it one day at a time and I think that was one thing last year that kind of helped flip a switch for me it was just really you know slowing down and you know taking things one step at a time and not really trying to get ahead of myself and focusing on the small things you know because they add up and you know make the bigger difference and um it's been fun out there I, I like the bullpen you know being, being in the back end of games you know when the game's on the line and everything matters so um but you know maybe maybe one day I'll get to start again you know who knows yeah. <laughs> so talk about that transition because we do season ticket holder events here when you guys are on the road our corporate sponsors and we we do a session in the bullpen and I try to explain to people like the mental side of a reliever and how the warm-up are different for a starter and a reliever so just go through that a little bit you're a starter all the way through the minor leagues you come up to to the major leagues and they're like all right you got to go in the bullpen that that's a different deal i mean you can't i try to explain there is no long toss and there is no Mm -hmm. 40 50 pitches before because you got to throw again tomorrow walk people through um what that difference is and how that how you had to learn that yeah i mean coming up to the minor leagues you you have four days off you're chilling just cheering on the boys and you know take the ball every fifth or sixth day and then you know worry about getting through six innings hopefully and then you know repeat the process for however many starts you have that year and then you know when we broke camp in 19 I was kind of an abbreviated starter because they had the thought of you know maybe I need to get called up and you know how guys get called up and sent down all the time and so I was either four innings or 60 pitches where I started the year and ended up getting called up in like two weeks so um, getting called up, you know, being in the bullpen, the thought of being available every day just sounded exhausting. You know, I was like, what? I got to be ready to throw every day, you know, and my, I feel like crap today. I don't want to throw today, you know, but you start, you don't feel great every fifth day, but you feel pretty good most of the time, you know, and then you pitch back to back and like, Hey, you got an out or, you know, two outs today. And you're like, dude, I just threw 40 pitches in two days. I don't want to pitch today. And then, so it's kind of being able to be mentally tough and kind of flip the switch and, you're able to pitch through a lot more than you really give yourself credit to, you know, and there's a difference between soreness and actually being hurt. And, you know, that's one thing I learned having like Andrew Miller and guys down there when I was in the bullpen as a rookie in 19 and 20 and 21 and just trying to kind of find my footing. And, you know, I think he was a big help for me having him down there because he was, you know, one of the game's best relievers for five years or so, however long it was. And he, he was really fun to have down there and, you know, really quiet guy. But, you know, when you talk to him, he'd open up and, 
you know, I really think having him down there for me and a lot of those guys is really helpful. Yeah, I, I try to explain to people, you know, you you really like 12 to 15 pitches is kind of your ideal warm up, yeah. you know, and then if it's a long inning, you got to you got to get yourself to understand you don't need more cuz you still got, you know, seven out there on the mound or whatever. Um and and how that adds up. You know, Isringhausen used to throw. That was that was his how he dealt with anxiety. So he would get up you know, as a closer, it's a little easier because you're usually not coming in between innings. But inning would end, he would get up and he would throw, and he would throw the entire time. Well, Izzy was a horse too. I mean, yeah. he was a guy that could take it. But that's how he dealt with the anxiety. I mean, there's pitching changes, whatever. He's just steady throwing. <laughs> and and our bullpen uh, coach, nor everybody else, it's like, hey, sit down. They take the ball from you. Um, Anthony Reyes was a guy that that came down as a starter. He had this big long routine, and he really struggled adapting to that you know and they were like look if you're going to be down here we can't script this out for you knowing you're going to throw you know this inning on this day uh you really got to cut it down and uh, when i went to the rotation uh, i went right to adam and i said what do i do mm -hmm. you know like i've i've got i've adapted this this quick warm-up i'm not a guy that long tosses it doesn't take me a while and adam said stick with it and uh don't you know don't long toss and don't you know just stick with what you know um and for me i was concerned about having to add all these extra pitches on top of what I knew I was going right. to do that year anyway. But uh, I think it's pretty fascinating when people realize like, you're not just getting up there and just throwing the ball. There. Like there is such an art to it mm -hmm. and you have to learn how to do it because you're going to have to throw the next day or maybe, you know, the day after that. But having those veteran guys down there is such a, uh, a huge asset. You know, you got a bunch of young guys down mm -hmm. there. You're all trying to figure it out yourselves, but yeah. uh, having that guy down there um, or older guys is, is definitely a big help. But I want to dive into your year last year. Um, your year last year was incredible. Obviously, all star, but I mean, nine and one, you, you can't control <laughs> wins out of the bullpen. Right, so that's right. just the, there's always the guy every year that just right. wins. Like every time he's in, the team scores, or you come in when you're down by one and the team mm -hmm. always scores. Um, but a 1.25 ERA, 54 games. The the most impressive thing to me, like your your numbers have always been solid. When you look back, I mean, all your all your years have been solid. But batting average against was one twenty eight. You walked twenty and struck out ninety four. So the your other numbers were good, but like that one exploded. Like what was it about last year? You're you're into your what I guess fourth parts of your fourth year. Mm -hmm. What was it that just kind of was different than all those other years like i said wasn't wasn't like he had bad years before right. but like last year was like you, I, I mean that's that's hard to do i think my for my first year you know i was kind of like a a mop-up guy and just pitch you know like once a week so that was like really low stress and just kind of getting my footing you know so i had a decent rookie year and then pitched well in the playoffs that year and then i think 20 and 21 was mostly you know i had some knee injuries like nagging you know nothing too serious but stuff to kind of pitch through and um, I think that's what really kind of hindered me and it was on my land leg and I think it just stopped me from like landing strong you know and finishing to our home and I think I was kind of falling off on everything and was just really super inconsistent and my ball didn't really have much life on it and you know I think going to last year being healthy and figured out how to throw my four seam a little bit better and had more life on it and you know slider was good too and started mixing in my curveball more and I think just really getting that confidence, you know, that all my stuff plays in the zone, you know, no matter what count, if I'm behind guys, I can still attack them. And, you know, always strikeouts are cool and stuff. But I'm trying to get quick outs. You know, like you said, you're trying to be available every day. I'd rather feel good and get quick outs than, you know, strike out three and throw 24 <laughs> pitches and try to throw the next day. So, um, but yeah, last last year was a lot of fun, man. I mean, so, so, so many cool things happening and I'm very thankful for for last year. So there's there's times where it just falls in line. You're like, hey, I don't know. I'm not going to think about it. I'm just going to roll. I'm just going to go with it. I don't really know what's going on, but I'm just going to keep going. But obviously you're going to take some of last year and say, okay, this is who I need to be. So is it is it um, – you know, you said you're mixing your curveball in more. Like is it, it just – is it a better understanding of who you are, uh, how to use your pitches, what pitches you throw after other pitches, how – you know – what pitches work in different counts like is it is it a matter of that or is it just purely the fact that you trust it and your stuff's dominant what I, I, mean? I think more that I just trust it more now you know I mean there's always that constant mental battle with yourself you know especially being in the bullpen and stuff and every day and being in the big leagues you know all this pressure to you know you're wanting to win especially in St. Louis you know um so I think it's just like not really finding you know like that feel good in my results and just going out there and trusting my stuff and like whatever happens happens really is kind of the mentality I really took 
last year and kind of carried that over this year too like whatever happens is what's meant to be and that's kind of how i roll with it and you know just control the things i can control you know that's all you can do you know i mean so many things that are out of your control in baseball you know you let the ball go and anything could happen you could throw the worst pitch of your life and strike someone out and throw the best <laughs> one and still get up a hit you know it's just kind of the nuances of the game well and that that takes trust and experience because like you said now you're in the back end it's one thing when you do that in a mop-up role mm -hmm. early on it's another thing to go out there and say hey i'm gonna put all this out not think about any of this and i'm just gonna attack with my best stuff and when it leaves my hand i'm fully convicted on mm -hmm. what i'm throwing here uh but that takes time to go out there in a, in a one run game and sure. against the three, four, five of the lineup and say, <laughs> okay, sure. here we go. You For know, sure. my stuff's good enough. Yeah. Um, yeah. Some nights asked to go one plus, you know, and it's just like, you know, I mean, I'd rather that guy beat me than me beat myself. You know, I'm not trying to walk guys. I don't want anybody to get on base, you know, and then a bloop and a blast, you know, then the game's over. So really just trying to, it's going to be hard for guys to string together multiple hits, you know, and against anybody in the big leagues, it doesn't matter who it is, not just myself, but it's hard to hit in this league and you know sometimes as pitchers we can give those guys too much credit so just trying to go out there and really just believe in myself well and that's a big part too if you look at okay if i don't walk guys and opponents are hitting 125 you got to trust the numbers yeah i mean i mean the numbers don't lie so if i attack and i throw my game chances are they're not going to get a hit and i'm not going to walk them and i got you got pretty good defense behind you yeah. i mean that, that that's got to be a big part of it too yeah i mean we got gold glovers everywhere yeah. you know so just trusting it and you know just having those guys having to swing and put the pressure on the batter you know from pitch one and i think that's been huge here in st louis you know we have won two team gold gloves and you have nolan who's won 10 and goalie with like five you know so i mean it's it's kind of dumb and not smart not to <laughs> trust your stuff you know and just be in the zone yeah you hear the the guys that played in the 80s they talk about what well, we had you know the best infield maybe ever in baseball with Ozzy anchoring it short and you had Vince Coleman and Willie McGee and you had all these guys in the outfield and they're like we couldn't wait for guys to hit it mm -hmm. you know we're, we're not trying to strike anybody out uh and the Cardinals I don't know if they're that that level of that team in the 80s that we had here but uh, but man they're they're pretty close um you, you've been around there's been a lot of changes you know since your time with the Cardinals like you said with um with with Wayno with Yachty uh, with managers kind of changing so I mean how have you kind of settled in with all the change that's kind of go on around you there there's a lot in mean, my time here it was I played for Tony we had those anchors of Carpenter and you know Wainwright Albert left at the end of that but I mean there was a, it was a pretty steady um, steady hand here the last few years there's, there's been a lot of a lot of shakeups a lot of people moving but you know how has that affected you or how have you kind of stayed yeah the, the simplest way I can explain it I feel like is like your junior year you know you have your senior year friends you know like you play sports and then they leave and you show up the next year and you're like I'm, I'm like the guy now you know like you you expected more of you and then like your friends are gone so it feels weird you know but I mean it's kind of the way life is you know life goes on I guess you know and just trying to take it one day at a time you know with that too and just um you know trying to be a good example you know because my fifth year down there now so kind of a leader down there in the bullpen and just trying to be someone, you know, to pour into those younger guys and, you know, and help them as much as I can. And then Yachty, what was his, I mean, the luxury of having him for the first part of your career to learn a lot of that. People ask all the time, what's it like throwing a Yachty? I said, well, if you can do what he asks you to do, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, cause you're not shaking, right. you know, you're, you're, you're pretty much just going with, I mean, he's doing all the research for you, but he's going to ask you to do things that you better be able to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I wasn't good at a first pitch curveball. That wasn't my deal. My if I could hold that till two strikes, then Yadi, you know, a guy on second, second and third, Yadi be like curveball. I'm like, oh boy, <laughs> you know, we better. I better figure out how to do it because that's yeah. that's what he thinks we need to do to be successful. But what was him um, being involved in your early part of your career? I mean, what's your what are you going to take from that and use the the rest of your time that that you're playing? Yeah, I mean, first coming up, being able to throw to all time legend like him was pretty nerve-wracking in itself you know like you want to do good for this guy and your team and um but just having him back there man was you know I don't even know how to explain it and I didn't know how spoiled we really were but you know you don't even really have to think out there like you said you know he's just the presence of him being back there and like the confidence he portrayed and give you know to use the pitcher you know is just indescribable and not having to think as much like you said out there and you know doing all the research and you know he's faced all those guys multiple times and seen every type of hitter there is you know and feel like he was always just one step ahead you know and you know he just always had that presence about him and other teams respected him too and I don't know that we'll ever see another catcher like him in the game you know um so he'll, he's definitely greatly missed you know and we love him here in St. Louis obviously and 
you know, just trying to take that mindset, you know, every every pitch matters and every game matters, you know, and he he wanted to win every day that he was back there, and, you know, I think that's what made him so great. He his, his, uh, The opponents feared him, but all his teammates feared him too. <laughs> I mean, Yachty was like, he, he kind of had his own little deal, especially during a game, like when he got going, man, it was like, I'm, I do not want to make you mad. I'm staying on your side, and I'm glad you are on our side. Um, I've never seen anybody – as like to me you talk about the mental side like you don't want to burn out of the bullpen I, I tell people when you sit down in the bullpen the first five innings are pretty chill mm -hmm. right especially if you're a late inning guy you, you can't mentally lock in from pitch one all the way through the thing that impresses me most about him is that he's locked in at 12 30 mm -hmm. when he shows up here and he's watching video I mean anytime you walk in you go in there and he's watching video he's first one in the field and offensively he's locked in every pitch defensively he's locked in every pitch and the way he went that was the thing that impressed me most about him was like i the physical side you know he played till he was 40 years old right was one of the best defensive catchers we've ever seen but man the mental side of that like that's exhausting yeah, like I, I, can't, I couldn't do that for a game or a week but let alone 19 years like he did yeah, <laughs> you I mean, know it's crazy those catchers are a different breed man i tell them i don't know if i could i could do that those guys sit back there bang their bodies up their knees you know and 100 degrees with 20 pounds of gear on and <laughs> you know the way he controlled the game too like you said you know he's calling pitches and looking at the runners and I remember Bader talking about how he would give him signals in center mm -hmm. field, you know, mm -hmm. telling him where to play, you know. And I'm like, dude, I don't even notice that when I'm pitching. Like, how, where's he giving you the signal, you know? And, you know, he's those uh, off speed pitch and he waves at Goldie or Nolan or whoever's on first and third to tell him, you know, it might come your way. He might be on front, heads up. So just how smart he was, man. And, you know, the way he was able to slow the game down is so cool to see. And it was so fun to be a part of. I, I left here, went somewhere else, and I had a catcher. And I said, hey, I, if I throw that cutter in, it's going to – like can you let the first baseman know because it's the only way it's going to beat me is right down the line mm -hmm. and he looked at me like i had six heads and he's like you want me to do what <laughs> and i'm like oh never mind yeah i, I just kind of walked <laughs> yeah. away i was like well yachty did it you know yeah. like I it's thought maybe you could do it yeah. but all right i get it you know it's just he he was different you yeah. know and and him and it, you should have well you did play with him and albert but when albert was playing first every day they played their own little game mm -hmm. um and jo was on the bench kind of running that it was it was crazy, man. <laughs> Those, they were in their own little world, um, and it was fun fun to watch. But um, real quick before we get you out of here, what about the rule changes? What what do you, I mean, pitch clock, pitch com? Like, like I said, there's been a lot of changes in mm -hmm. baseball in the last uh, handful of years. Uh, how have you kind of adapted to that? What do you think of it? Yeah, so we had the pitch clock a little bit in the minor leagues when I started, but I think it was a few seconds longer, so I wasn't really too worried about it. And it it honestly still feels pretty fast. You know, the game's super quick now, yeah. especially with no guys on. That extra five seconds makes a big difference. Um, but, I mean, I like pitch calm a lot. I think it's really helpful to the game, especially with the pitch clock now. There's, I don't think there's any chance we'd be able to do 15 seconds if we didn't have pitch calm. It'd be hard to shake, and it's still hard to shake now even with pitch calm. So that, that's what I wanted to talk about. Like, the we, we've heard the conversations about pitch selection and all that kind of stuff. Really, when I'm watching it, I'm like, well, you only got one, maybe two mm -hmm. shots. Yeah. And then you got to go with it. Right. Right. I mean, so that's a whole different mindset there. You can't shake, 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 step off, come out and talk to me. I mean, it's I, you don't see a whole lot of shaking anymore. No. And so I think maybe what you might start seeing is the pitchers wearing it mm -hmm. where they can signal it in. But but what you go back to talking about, like with Yachty, like you didn't have to think. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden it. it like when I was there, Tony called. He he ran all the 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 uh, the pickoffs. You mm -hmm. could not pick off unless it came from Tony. You couldn't do it on your own. Well, I love that because mm -hmm. I'm like, cool. I don't have to worry about that now. All I have to do is worry about this. Well, now I gotta find the button, <laughs> yeah. signal it in, you know, and yeah. then it it just it, that's that's a lot different. And then that time frame you have, then the, that puts a panic in you to where you're like, okay. And this is what I want you to talk about. If 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 you're not fully convinced that that's the right pitch you got to throw it now yeah and it's probably not going to be good either right. if you're not convicted and you know and you really have to be set probably by like six seconds so you really only have like 10 seconds to do whatever you want because if you're coming set at three seconds every time the guy at first is probably going to time you up and even then the batter is going to get a better time on you, you know i mean Scherzer used to talk about it all the time making hitters wait and throw them off balance with holds and there's really not that aspect in the game anymore guys can kind of time you up and a lot of pitchers are falling into more of like a habit you know and they don't really notice what they're doing because they're forced by the pitch clock so I think it's gonna this first year is gonna be a lot of learning and growing for a lot of guys and trying to figure that out so what you throw a pitch I mean immediately you have in your head right mm -hmm. like what you think 
probably your next pitch is going to be. You're probably not 100% set on it because you want to see what the catcher is going to, what he's thinking, what he's seeing. But you got a pretty good idea, right? Okay, this is what I throw in this count. So now all of a sudden you get back on the mound and you get the ball, and he doesn't put that down. So are you thinking now, <laughs> like, okay, I got to adjust, and then I got to, before I come set and throw this ball, like, I have to be on board with this? Or are you shaking? Or like, where where does that where does that come yeah, into play? Yeah, it's tough. I mean, it really starts to speed up then, especially with no guys on, because you don't have you know with guys on you have two disengagements, but with nobody on you don't have any disengagements. So I mean, you probably see it once a night a guy scrambling to come set at <laughs> three or four, and then you know he probably box. He's not even really set, <laughs> right. and he just rips a pitch in the dirt or leaves it high in arm side or you know who knows what. But um, yeah, it, it's tough. I mean, you definitely I don't think anybody's you know not had any struggles with it so far, and. I think it's just going to be a constant battle on another, you know, component to the game. What about the bigger bases? At first, I was like, bigger bases? Why don't they make home plate bigger? You know, like, why <laughs> yeah. that? you want to speed the game? Right, well, let's right. let, can we at least make home plate bigger, bigger strike zone? And and I heard a a, a show on maybe opening day or leading up to opening day on MLB Network, and they were talking about uh, Theo Epstein was in there talking about he was on the rules committee or whatever helped develop this, and it all kind of made sense. So you're three inches bigger, or whatever each way. So you, entices more stolen bases more action i'm i'm a fan of the no shift i I like the athleticism and seeing the diving plays again and granted i love giving up a hard hit and thinking it's a hit (laughs) and the guy's right there but i also hated giving up a what you thought was a routine and the guy's not there so Mm -hmm. it goes it goes both ways but um you know to me it it seems like you know it's definitely a faster game Mm -hmm. um I'm a traditionalist. I don't like messing with a whole lot, but I, right. I like seeing guys in their normal positions making the athletic plays again, and uh, and guys stealing bases again. I mean, it, you know, you don't. We didn't see hardly any stolen bases, any bunning, any kind of that, and it, it's starting to come back a little bit. Right. I mean, you, like you said earlier, we could hold the ball for however long you wanted it, so guys would get bored over there. It's like I'm not stealing. It's 100 degrees out here. I'm sweating my bag off, so I'm not trying to go out there and you know waste my time. And so. I, th- I like I like the no shift now. I do too. I, I like the bigger bases too. I think it's safer for guys. I think it's better for them and you know more stolen bases, more action. You know, and kind of a different game of baseball almost. You know now, so it's it's been exciting, and I'm I'm sure fans have loved it so far. Uh, the fans probably can't realize it, but when we when I saw the bigger bases down at Fantasy Camp in January, I was, I was like, oh my gosh! Yeah, they look. I mean, they're, they're, they look huge, and yeah. then now you start to get used to it a little bit. But we were out here last week doing a, a corporate event, and they had them out there, and it was just like, man. I mean, it, it takes me a little while to to get used to them, but you, the, the game's changing for sure, and um, you know, good, bad, whatever it is. But but I, I it the the pitch com thing and and the. The pitch clock to me obviously the ones that that impact you the most so i i appreciate your uh your insight on that and we're going to respect your time here as as you're doing this on a on a, a day that you have a game so we're going to let you get out of here but uh ryan thank you so much for for being on the chatters box podcast and uh for all of you listening you can uh you can watch this on the youtube channel the cardinals youtube channel along with all our other podcasts that we've done this year going back to last year and uh we look forward to seeing the next episode